And now I present to you James P. Madonna and the Reverend Dr. William J. Eisenman. Okay, we're back. Thank you very much, William H. Morrow III, for your words of wisdom. Doing promo, we are back for the uh, following uh, video to this week's Progressive Discussion Show. Continue. Democratic presidential candidate, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, first Television ads started airing on Sunday morning. Seven bells for Bernie Sanders. In the early voting states of Iowa and New Hampshire. That's a two million dollar commercial, right? A two million dollar buy that will last for ten days. That's it? What a ripoff. They really screw you, the fucking television TV time, don't they? Thousands of Americans have come to see Bernie speak, and we've seen great response to his message, said Senator's campaign manager Jeff Weaver. Charlie Weaver from the Hollywood Squares. This ad marks the next phase of this campaign. We are bringing that message directly to the voters of Iowa and New Hampshire. The ads give voters a fuller look at the Vermont Senator's biography. As a longtime fighter against injustice and inequality. Well, I don't know if it's MSNBC, but mainstream media is claiming that uh, in... Uh, either North or South Carolina, Hillary Clinton is way ahead of Bernie Sanders amongst the blacks. Now how can that be if Bernie Sanders is the only one who marched with the civil rights leaders back in the early 1960s? Bingo. You know what I mean? Bingo. Perception. I think they're lying about the polls, about Hillary being ahead. Well, they believe uh, there's a there's a s big segment of the blacks who believe that only a uh, well-connected uh, Democrat can bring about the things that they really need. Well-connected, you know? Yeah. Like, like, forget about the fact that Bernie Sanders has been a They're United States senator yeah. for that for that long, and and actually marched with civil rights leaders. Yeah, but, he can't, but he can't get anything done, because he's only one person. When he puts it forth for a bill, there's no co-signers to it. In other words, they want to vote for the lesser of the two evils again. Yeah. And Hillary is the lesser of the two evils. That's great. Well, no, not, not amongst Bernie. She's, she's, the, she's the lesser of the two evils amongst Republicans. And Democrats. And, in and general. other, we're talking about corporatist Democrats. Sellouts, uh, super PAC receiving Democrats. Yeah. Okay. And his humble upbringing in Brooklyn and his attendance at Dr. Martin Luther King's march on Washington in 1963. There's his work as the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. And in Congress, and his pledge to take on Wall Street and a corrupt political system. Break up the big banks, which Hillary Clinton avoided answering. Because or, they or, or, paid her. Or said no, yeah. And mention of the one million contributors to his campaign and footage of his large rallies around the nation. The ads are also a not subtle dig at the Clinton political brand. People are sick and tired of establishment politics. And they want some real change, Sanders says in the spot. 
Sanders is competitive with Clinton in the first contests of Iowa and New Hampshire. And his fundraising has been stronger than expected. More than $40 million raised, mostly online. He's still drawing large crowds. A college forum at George Mason University in Virginia on Wednesday filled a small field house with 1,700 students as people at 300 colleges watched online. Sanders is trying to expand his coalition beyond white liberals, college students, and working class supporters. He has a major deficit with black voters. who are crucial in South Carolina, which follows the New Hampshire primary on the calendar. If you, um, if you go with the corporatist Hillary Clinton, you're a fool and you are a dumbass, plain and simple. You are, uh, you are an imbecile. An imbecile. Yeah. Former President George H. W. Bush has finally revealed what he really thinks of his son's presidency. Faulting George W. Bush for setting on an abrasive tone on the world stage and failing to rein in the hawkish president Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, hawkish because he, he made a fortune off of the war. And former Defense Chief Donald Rumsfeld. In years, in a years long series of interviews with biographer John Meacham, the elder Bush frowned on the sometimes hot rhetoric of George W. Bush, saying such language may get headlines, but it doesn't necessarily solve the diplomatic problems. The older Bush faulted Cheney and Rumsfeld for their iron ass views. Gee, it would be great if he mentioned corp, um, a war profiteering. That would be nice calling Rumsfeld an arrogant fellow. Oh, he's a fellow. He's an arrogant demon. And saying Cheney had changed markedly from the days when he served in the first Bush administration. As Vice President Cheney had his own empire there and marched to his own drummer, the elder Bush said, adding he just became very hard line and very different from the Dick Cheney I knew and worked with. Oh, well, he became greedy. Well, we can thank Dick Cheney also for all the privatization that has gone on in the military since then. There's a lot of blood on his hands, both of them. G.W. and Dick Cheney. A lot of blood. Ultimately, the elder Bush assigned fault to his son for Cheney's overreach and for fostering a global impression of American inflexibility. It's not Cheney's fault. It's the president's fault, the elder Bush said. The buck stops there. Yeah, yes, yes. For all of that, though, the elder Bush did not suggest that he disagreed with his son's decision to invade Iraq, saying Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein is gone. And with him went a lot of brutality and nastiness and awfulness. awfulness. And also went Iraq into turmoil. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, it was. It would have been the, also the lesser of the two evils to just leave the Middle East alone and keep Saddam Hussein in office. It would have been, I mean, he's no angel by no means. And but he was fighting a 10-year war with Iran there, too. Now, I'm talking about the, uh, keeping the, uh, I mean, he did use poison gas on the Kurds, the Kurdish rebels, but, you know, as far as the existence of uh, ISIS and, uh, uh, I mean, Al-Qaeda was there. No, it wasn't. Al Qaeda wasn't there. No. All right. Now the the uh, Afghanistan, the, the Saudi um, culprits of 9/11, uh -huh. they were just called terrorists of 9/11, right? They're not. They weren't Taliban's. They weren't Al Qaeda. They were Saudi Arabians. They were Saudi Arabia, include including Osama bin Laden. He was Saudi also, mm -hmm. and a former CIA agent. Yeah. The business people of the United States, rep working with the United States. Against the Russians in Afghanistan. And then he got a little hot headed. And he became his own man. Okay? Yeah, I saw that picture. Protected uh, by the Taliban. I saw that photo of the Taliban visiting Ronald Reagan in the White House. And Ronald Reagan having wonderful things to say about them. Nice. Well, that's because America, according to the Bible, buys its lovers and doesn't know its rightful enemies. Yeah. Well, also, yeah. I heard that uh, Afghanistan <clears throat> is very rich in natural resources for miners and. Uh, and let's not forget the poppy fields. Yeah, or let's not forget it's 14 years that the United States is still there. For what reason? Where is the reason? Just another Vietnam. Okay. Where's now, the reason? Now they want to make Syria just another Vietnam. The assessments are contained in Meacham's 800-plus page, Destiny and Power. Okay. The fullest account yet of Bush, the only modern ex-president not to write a full-length <coughs> memoir. Maybe a full-length embarrassment. Meacham, uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, I mean prize. Pulitzer? Yeah, pull your own, sir, okay? Pulitzer. <laughs> For his Andrew Jackson biography. Celebrity Bells. American Lion. Pulitzer. Draws on Bush's diaries and on interviews he conducted with Bush from 2006 to 2015. The book is being publicly released on Tuesday. Army Pulitzer. Jeb Bush, who is running for the Republican presidential nomination, said he hadn't read the book, but he showed no inclination to echo his father's criticisms. My thought was that Dick Cheney served my dad really well. Oh, really? Well, there were two peas in a pod then. Bush said on Thursday in New Hampshire. Kissing up to old Cheney, huh? As vice president, he served my brother really well. Different uh, eras and different times. Well, you know, that statement is going to hurt Jeb Bush's uh, oh, uh, campaign. Well, I got news for you. It ain't too much that can hurt it too much because I think it's down to 1%. How about Christie? Is he down there too? 1%. What about... Christie has to be at the little boys and girls table on Tuesday for the uh, debate. What about the horse-faced Carly Fiorina? No, she's going to be with the eight on the stage. Yeah. There's still eight? Yeah. They, they don't know when to... Uh, 
quit, do they? Not when they had this money, the Coke money behind them and everything. So the Cokes want to keep, they want to keep the clown bus going. Going. Yeah. They don't want it to dwindle. No. Because under normal circumstances, you wouldn't have eight up there. No. <coughs> Excuse me. George W. Bush, too, was measured in his reaction, saying that he was proud to have served with Dick Cheney. Yeah, and yeah. And Dom Rumsfeld. Yeah, sure. i tell you one thing. Donald Trump is a blessing in disguise because the way his personality is, the way he just exposes all the other Republicans, that, that should help the Democratic uh, not, um, nominees, not nominees, the Democratic uh, participants. Dick Cheney did a superb job as Vice President. Oh, God. Superb job, and then the, the disclaimer of what? And I was fortunate to have him by my side throughout my presidency. Don Rumsfeld ably led the Pentagon and was an effective Secretary of Defense. In the book, George W. Bush was asked about his father's criticisms of his own language and allowed that his rhetoric had been pretty strong but he was unrepentant on that count. They understood me in Midland, he said, referring to the Texas town where he was raised. Midland, Texas. It's in the pan, the upper panhandle, where Waco is, and Amarilli, Amarillo. The elder Bush, for his part, said he was not he wasn't sure what had changed Cheney, but he added that he thought the 911 attacks had made Cheney more hawkish about the U.S. as military force. Just iron ass, the elder Bush said, his seeming knuckling under to the real hard charging guys who want to fight about everything. Old iron ass. Let's ah. call her old crooked ass. Is more like it. <laughs> very invigorating show. I, I am very happy with it. Well, now we're going to change the pace. Tomato paste. Very hard hitting. My wife and I have been married. For almost 20 years. Holy shit. We're building a house. We're building a fucking house. And we've been faithful to each other. Ooh, Rachel. Ooh, we've been faithful. I don't know if uh, you get this question often, but here it goes. Yeah. Can my wife give me permission to have an affair? just by him bringing up. Hold on. This motherfucker next to her, I swear. Just, ju should I wrap him with my shillelagh now or later? Just by him bringing up that question to his wife will cause World War III in his marriage. I met a somewhat younger woman uh -oh. through a friend at work, and the fireworks were immediate and amazing. He's going through uh, male menopause, I guess. My wife does not know this woman, and I don't think that my having an affair with her would hurt our family or our children. Oh, he's delusional. Still, I don't want to have the affair clandestinely. I'm frankly not sure what my wife would say if I asked her. <laughs> she seems to get away with lots of things. 
Uh oh, really? If she says yes, do you think it would be okay? He wants to have a threesome or he just wants to have an affair? An affair. What do you mean That's she all. gets away with all sorts of things? We don't know. We don't know. Hmm. He's just probably using that to justify what he thinks he wants. I already know the answer. Okay. Well, you've cracked the code. You figured it out. Getting your wife to sign off on your infidelity is a stroke of genius. Because, as everyone knows, cheating doesn't really cause all that much marital disruption or familial heartache. <coughs> and if you have permission, then it's not cheating. Everybody wins. Uh, it, it, it'll be, it'll be it won't be a sincere permission. It will be like a, like a test. Like, oh, you want it that badly? Go ahead. I dare you. It's that. It'll be that kind of permission. A test. It is strange that you want not only your wife's permission to have an affair, but also mine. <laughs> but because you ask so nicely. I'll give you an honest answer. <laughs> no. See, I knew I, I knew I, uh, oh my I God. knew what the result w w w would be. Oh my! The God. guy's a first-class Ninkum poop. A Nim Cammy poop. A Nim Cammy uh, poop. You want to do another Carson, or are we have seven bells for uh, who was that? Amy Dickinson? Or we? Yeah. Oh, we had enough uh, Carson for the day. Well. Is it, um... It's about him it, leading Trump into polls. Is it big? We got something here on Mr. Christie. All right, let's do, go to Christie. Well, I don't mind doing Carson again. All right, we'll put him I on mean, the side. I, I mean, because it's we'll apple, ap it's applicable to current uh, news topics. Currents and raisins, yeah, I know. But so is Chris Christie. In his latest brush, with commuters, Governor Christie was heckled online Sunday by fellow Amtrak passengers who caught him having phone conversations in the quiet car. Before Christie even got off the train, the whole thing began to explode across the internet yeah. in a loud and confusing din of varying witness accounts and dozens of news reports. Well, you know that that rich conservatives are special and and rules and laws don't apply to them. Of course. Twitter users debated all day whether Christie was an out-of-touch bore or just a guy who stepped into the wrong train car. No, he's just a fat, obnoxious dictator. He's, he's a right-wing, fat blowhard. He knows what he's doing. The quiet car is meant to be an oasis of peace and relaxation. Like the public library. For otherwise harried East Coast commuters. Even passengers using headphones must keep the volume low enough so that the audio cannot be heard by other passengers. That's why it's called the quiet car. Amtrak instructs on its website. The Christie kerfluffle showed once again that anything can quickly catch fire in the U.S. presidential race. Blogs and newspapers and wire services, magazines, CNN and two British newspapers all dissected the news. Really? That popular? 
Google had found 172 news articles about Christie's lapse in train etiquette. The governor caught the 955 Acela Express train heading north from Washington on his way back from the CBS studio. They're where he had been a guest on Face the Nation. They're expecting etiquette manners from an already obnoxious right-wing boar. boar, yeah. And a political bully. They're expecting etiquette from him. It's, it's not going to happen. Christie was apparently in a hurry when he boarded the quiet car by mistake. Is there a sign that says quiet car? I'm sure there is. When a conductor passed by to collect tickets, he informed Christie of his grievous faux pas. And the governor retreated into the cafe car. Okay. And felt chastened. But before the train even got to New Jersey, the website Gawker had been tipped off by Alexander Mann, a passenger, who sent some pictures of the governor. Cool. He got on last minute yelling at his two Secret Service agents. I think because of a seat mix up sat down and immediately started making phone calls on the quiet car, man told Gawker. You can't stop people from um, doing what they want to do with their cell phone. Christie had one security guard and who was not a Secret Service agent. A second passenger leaped to Christie's defense on Twitter and castigated Gawker for running the story based solely on man's tip. About the Gawker fail, Chris Christie was super courteous and possibly the least intrusive in public phone person ever, Twitter user Katie Klabushis wrote. That was after the story had begun to go viral. Oh, you mean you mean it already caught on after the fact, you know, before he got he got uh, a reprimanded. It already was on its way to becoming viral. Samantha Smith, spokeswoman for Christie's presidential campaign, offered apologies to any offended passengers in a tongue-in-cheek response on a very full train this morning the governor accidentally took a seat in Amtrak's notorious quiet car. Smith wrote in an emailed statement after breaking the cardinal rule of the quiet car the governor promptly left once he realized the serious nature of his mistake and enjoyed the rest of his time on the train from the cafe car. Eh. It's the least of our worries in the United States. But it's it's reflective of um, the personality uh, of a conservative, especially one like Chris Christie. Um, now I hear, I hear Scott Walker of uh, Wisconsin is asking um, the people who have donated to his campaign to uh, continue to donate to... This has been a Mega Life 21 production. Hi, this is William H. Morrow. The best way to join our organization is to get your free annual subscription to Newsletter Censored with your gift to support this work. The newsletter of hard-hitting truth and news-fighting censorship and conservative propaganda since 1977.
There is nothing out there like the newsletter censored in the mainstream media or the press. This newsletter is the very best way to join and be a part of our organization. We're living the end times, so you need newsletter censored. Go to www.newslettercensored.com. Hi, I'm William Morrow. Wake up, people, because the truth is often, very often, a very, very hard pill to swallow. Hey, listen, for the real hard-hitting truth, you need Newsletter Censored. And now, back to the show.